And let's pause for another moment of prayer, realizing that we need the tutoring ministry of the Spirit to not only affirm this is God's Word, but to know what it looks like in daily practice as we are convicted of sin and exhorted towards righteousness. Father, we do ask for your help. We want to understand your Word, what you mean by what you've said, and we want to have lives that practice your truth. Help us to be more biblical in our desiring at a heart level. Help us to be more biblical in our thinking, to bring every thought captive to the obedience of Christ and His Word. Use this to affect our lives for eternity, we pray in Christ's name and for His sake. Amen. I'd like to preach to a sermon on sin's recompense. From Hosea 9, Hosea's message of warning continues for us this morning. 165 years ago, in 1857, the Reverend C.H. Spurgeon had preached a sermon on the Lord's Day, The Warning Neglected, which is quite apropos for Old Testament Israel that we've been studying about. He was preaching about the command to warn from Ezekiel 33, 5. He heard the sound of the trumpet and took not warning. His blood shall be upon his hands. He said, in all worldly things, men are always enough awake to understand their own interests. There is scarce a merchant who reads the paper who does not read it in some way or other with a view to his own personal concerns. If he finds that by the rise or fall of the market... He'll be either a gainer or a loser. That part of the day's news will be the most important to him. In politics, in everything, in fact, that concerns temporal affairs, personal interest usually leads the van. Men will always be looking out for themselves, and personal and home interests will generally engross the major part of their thoughts. But in religion, it seems to be otherwise. In religion, men love far rather to believe abstract doctrines and to talk of general truths than the searching inquiries which examine their own personal interest in it. You'll hear many men admire the preacher who deals in generalities, but when he comes to press home searching questions, by and by they are offended. If we stand and declare general facts such as the universal sinnership of mankind or the need of a Savior, they'll give an assent to our doctrine and possibly they may retire greatly delighted with the discourse, but it has not affected them. But how often will our audience gnash their teeth and go away in a rage because like the Pharisees with Jesus, they perceive concerning a faithful minister that he spoke of them. And yet, my brethren, how foolish this is. If in all these, all other matters, We like personalities if in everything else we look to our own concerns. How much more should we do so in religion? For surely every man must give an account for himself at the day of judgment. We must die alone. We must rise at the day of resurrection one by one. And each one for himself must appear before the bar of God. And each one must either have said to himself as an individual, Come ye blessed or else he must be appalled with a thundering sentence, depart ye cursed. If there were such a thing as national salvation, if it could be possible that we could be saved in the gross and in the bulk, like the sheaves of corn, the few weeds that may grow with the stubble would be gathered in for the sake of the wheat, then indeed it might not be so foolish for us to neglect our own personal interests. But if the sheep must every one of them pass under the hand of him that telleth them, if any man must stand in his own person before God to be tried for his own acts by everything that is rational, by everything that conscience would dictate and self-interest would command, let each of us look to our own selves, that we be not deceived and that we find not ourselves at last miserably cast away." He also said, justice may at times leave the courts of man, but it abides upon the tribunal of God. In our text before us, Hosea 
is going to continue to unpack a biblical theology of sin and judgment without leaving out the opportunity of repentance and salvation that would divert that judgment at the moment that they repent. Oh, dear friends, that we would learn these lessons well to be quicker to repent, to enjoy fellowship with God rather than experience His chastening in our lives. The Bible fashions all of our theology, does it not? There are ten major doctrines that can be systematically categorized, including the doctrine of man, anthropology, the doctrine of sin, hamartiology, and Hosea has even been developing much, not, not just our anthropology and our doctrine of sin, but he's also been enlarging theology proper, the first member of the Trinity. Hosea represents God, who is faithful to an unfaithful people. The proper way to develop our theology is developing authorial intent of each of the authors, whether we're with Hosea or Mark or the Apostle Paul. Each of the authors which the Spirit moved to pen Scripture, we start with the first verse of their book and we march through, developing their argument through to the, the last verse of their book. That is different than piecemeal, a verse here or there or a passage that is easy so that we could ignore the difficult. We read and study from cover to cover from the first verse to its closing verse. I would submit to you, beloved, that an inspired and inerrant word demands that our regular diet be verse by verse consecutive exposition, which we practice weekly here. If chapter 8 of Hosea is marked by urgency where there, God assures captivity and judgment's coming, then verse, uh, chapter 9 is marked by severity. Out of the frying pan, what? Into the fire. It contains the harshest and most definitive statements of God's wrath and judgment that we've encountered thus far in the book of Hosea. So friends, I want you to heed the word of warning of severe judgment that you and I could avoid it. First, by placing faith in Christ and finding refuge in Him who absorbed the full fury of the Father's wrath for sinners that would repent and believe. That's good news. There's no better news on planet earth that you can escape eternal wrath of God through His own beloved Son. And secondly, that if you're in Christ and you're a believer, You'd recall God does chasten His legitimate children, that they learn not to play with sin that hinders their worship, it hinders their fellowship with Him, it hinders their service of Him. Let's read the text and then we'll dive in. It probably won't be as deep a dive as typical and then we'll end with several exhortations, the implications of this text that we could take with us this morning Reading from Hosea 9, notice the first command. He says, do not rejoice, O Israel, with exaltation like the nations. For you have played the harlot, forsaking your God. You have loved harlot's earnings on every threshing floor. Threshing floor and wine press will not feed them, and the new wine will fail them. They'll not remain in the Lord's land, but Ephraim will return to Egypt. And in Assyria, they will eat unclean food. They will not pour out drink offerings of wine to the Lord anymore. Their sacrifices will not please Him. Their bread will be like mourner's bread. All who eat of it will be defiled, for their bread will be for themselves alone. It will not enter the house of the Lord. What will you do on the day of the appointed festival and on the day of the feast of the Lord? For behold, they will go because of destruction. Egypt will gather them up. Memphis will bury them, weeds will take over their treasures of silver, thorns will be in their tents. The days of punishment have come, the days of retribution have come. Let Israel know this, the prophet's a fool, the inspired man is demented because of the grossness of your iniquity and because your hostility is so great.' 
Ephraim was a watchman with my God, a prophet. Yet the snare of the bird catcher is in all his ways, and there is only hostility in the house of his God. They've gone deep in depravity as in the days of Gibeah. He will remember their iniquity. He'll punish their sins. I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in its first season. But they came to Baal Peor and devoted themselves to shame. They became as detestable as that which they loved. As for Ephraim, their glory will fly away like a bird. No bird, no pregnancy, no conception. Though they bring up their children, yes, I will bereave them until not a man is left. Yes, woe to them indeed when I depart from them. Ephraim, as I have seen, is planted in a pleasant meadow like Tyre. But Ephraim will bring out his children for slaughter. Give them, O Lord, what will you give? Give them a miscarrying womb and dry breasts. All their evil is at Gilgal. Indeed, I came to hate them there. Because of the wickedness of their deeds, I will drive them out of my house. I will love them no more. All their princes are rebels. Ephraim is stricken, their root is dried up, they will bear no fruit. Even though they bear children, I will slay the precious ones of their womb. My God will cast them away because they have not listened to him, and they will be wanderers among the nations. You know, this is a passage that is hard, it's heavy, it's devastating. And so look at, let's look at it together and draw some implications. First of all is the results of captivity in verses 1 to 6. They're going to be banished from the Lord's land that, they had, been promi- that had been promised to Abraham, and they'll be gathered up and made slaves again like they'd been back in Egypt land. But now it's going to be Assyria. And the stated reason that he'd Uh, given way back in Exodus 3 and Exodus 5 for why he was bringing them out of Egypt in the first place was that they might worship him. You know, if you wanted to jot down Exodus 3, 12 and Exodus 5, 1 to 3, in both of those passages is where God stated why he was going to send Moses to Pharaoh to say, let my people go. Why would he let them go? Why would they be released from his tyranny? Why would they redeem, be redeemed from slavery? For worship. That is the express biblical reason that God gives. And here in Hosea's day, several years hence, they'd return to false gods. So the Lord would return them to a land of slavery. Hosea calls it Egypt a couple of times, but then clarifies that it's a different kind of Egypt, full of all the slavery and the torture and the captivity, but it's a different people. It's the Assyrians. As false gods had made lavish promises of fertility, of agriculture, fertility of their livestock, so the only true God would remove Israel from the very land which made that prosperity possible in the first place. You remember the spies that went into the land? Are we really going to do the deed? Yeah, I mean, the, the clusters of grapes, they're, they're huge. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. It's a prosperous land. But the unfaithful uh, Spies came back and said, what, there, there's Anakim in the land, you know, I don't know if we can conquer them, in spite of the strong arm of hand of God that took them out of Egypt. So here you've got a people who will no longer enjoy the produce of the land, verses 1 to 3. No longer enjoy the produce of the land. There's a lot of passages of Scripture we could run to particularly the Psalms that call God's people to rejoice. Why do we often have a call to worship from the Psalms? Because constantly He's doing what He did for us this morning, calling the people to rejoice. And yet the opening of our text this morning is a command of the opposite. It's striking. Do not rejoice. And the boycott on celebration is followed by the Lord's reproaches on the nation as a whole, 
of the false prophets of the land and the political leaders. No rejoicing allowed. You're not going to do those worship ceremonies of Baal with the nations around you at the threshing floor. They'd been appointed to be the people of God with standards a lot higher than those of the heathen with their false gods. And instead, they're, they're denying their own supreme God and attributing their blessings to the heathen gods. Look at this God who brought us out of Egypt and brought all this bounty in our lives. And man was fashioning his own idols that rocks and falls on its face and even rots. This was spiritual adultery, analogous to the physical adultery practiced by prostitutes. The flesh, fr threshing floors were often used by the Canaanites for carrying out their fertility rites, and we won't get into any more detail as to what went on. So Hosea says, do not rejoice. You're not going to remain in the land of Yahweh. Verse, beginning of verse 3, they will not remain in the Lord's land, but they'll return to Egypt and in Assyria. You know, the, the nation too often forgot that the promised land belonged to him, and they were to be responsible tenants in that land. For instance, in, in uh, Leviticus 25, verse number 18 God had said, you shall thus observe my statutes and my judgments so as to carry them out so that you may live securely on the land. Then the land will yield its produce so that you can eat your fill and live securely in it. Leviticus 25, 23. The land, moreover, shall not be sold permanently for the land, God says, is my land. For you are but aliens and sojourners with me. So they were to be in the land and appreciate and overflow with worship. But they didn't. So they'd return to an Egypt experience in Assyria and eat unclean food. Since they'll be expelled from the holy land to an unclean one, Food would be nothing but unclean, and that's unacceptable for a holy God. Leading into the next problem, in you know, verses 4 to 6, the people will no longer aver, uh, observe Levitical rituals. Captives will become defiled. They'll become unclean people who were supposed to be the holy people of God. Unholy offerings must not enter the house of Yahweh. In verse 5, he asks an, an appropriate, practical question. In fact, it's rhetorical. He says, what will you do on the day of the appointed festival? You know, when you get to the unclean land as an unclean people, where there is unclean worship, are you going to engage? On that day of the feast of the Lord. They won't be able to celebrate feast days that was established through Moses. Not only would there be judgment for their sins in the foreign land, but no more corporate worship. Let's think about how this goes in our own lives, not just these people far removed several centuries from us. When we pollute ourselves... With sin, there is guilt and there is shame. Our conscience is activated. It affects our own personal worship, does it not? And it affects our outlook ahead because we cannot be victorious and confident in our walk with Jesus when we're polluting ourselves. It affects our personal worship, our outlook ahead, and it even affects public worship when we come, to come together because we are a, an unclean people at that moment. We need to live in such a way as we're pursuing holiness and inviting others into fellowship with our train God. This last week in our Bible study, we were looking at First uh, John 1, the principle of fellowship. Holy people 
set apart unto righteousness, coming together for fellowship so that they can... Uh, the picture that John gives us in 1 John 1 is that as we're enjoying vital fellowship with the Lord, we've confessed our sins, we're in union with Christ, that we're calling others into that fellowship that we're enjoying with our triune holy God. We're no help to ourselves. We're no help to those around us when we're living a debauched life of sin. It affects others. And he gives this assurance in verse 6 that they will go. And the next several verses coming up are what we'd said earlier in the book in regards to promised judgment. Notice how he phrases things. He says, they will go because of destruction. Egypt will gather them. Memphis will bury them. Weeds will take over their treasures. These are prophetic perfects in the Hebrew, meaning that it hasn't quite taken place, but you can bet your bottom dollar it's right around the corner. It's on the horizon. In God's book, it's as good as done. It will assuredly occur. So here they are going, marching off to an unholy land, unable to celebrate holy days, no temple for worship, no wine offerings. And as you get into verses 7 to the end of the chapter, you've got captivity's recompense for Israel's sin. What they have sown, they will reap. In the chapter last week, they sow the wind, they reap the, the whirlwind. In verses 7 to 9, kind of captures the sinful attitude of the people toward the prophets. As stated, have come in both instances of punishment and recompense are viewed as already having begun. Days of punishment have come. Days of retribution have come. Israel needs to know this. When they're saying that the prophet's a fool, the inspired man is demented, it seems best to view Hosea as Yahweh's true prophet, herein exposing the lying cult and court prophets of Israel. A similar scenario we read about in 1 Kings 22. No need to go back there in your Bible. Just think with me for a moment. In 1 Kings 22, you've got Micaiah who exposes Ahab's ear-tickling prophets. When we read about prophets in the Old Testament, we've got to look and see which prophets are we dealing with. Are we dealing with the false prophets of Baal up on Mount Carmel who are cutting themselves with lances, trying to get their false God's attention? Or were these prophets that are God sent? In verse 8 of 1 Kings 22, you know, the, the nations are trying to get the king's attention. They're asking Ahab, why don't you ask the real prophet? Because we've got to know if we're going to be victorious over Israel. Ahab says, but I hate him because he never prophesies good for me. So I'm not going to ask him what he's got to say. Verse 12 of 1 Kings 22, all the false prophets, they're saying, go up and, and uh, prosper. And yet the one true prophet of God say, no way, Jose, you're, you're going to fail. You're going to fail miserably. Here are the prophets, even in Hosea's day, turning a blind eye to their call to holiness. Similar to Jeremiah conveying divine judgment while many people were chanting, peace, peace, false prophets may be saying, your best life today. No, it may not be. You know, the first line of verse 8 in our text seems an, a an affirmation of a true prophet, a watchman who warns the people of all kinds of impending danger. If he proves faithful, he stands in intimate relationship with his God. 
Hosea was that prophet of his day. And as devastating and hard and harsh as these words are, they're words of warning that they might turn and repent. There's good news in that. Like, like the faithful prophet Nathan, who came to David with his, his finger in his face and says, thou art the man. You've done this deed. He uncovers David's sin with Bathsheba, and David eventually repented. A faithful prophet's going to be like Ezekiel in his day. When obstinate people will not hear or turn from their sin, but delivers God's word. God tells Ezekiel that they're an obstinate, a stiff-necked people, but speak my word to them. They'll know a prophet's been in their midst. You know, Jeremiah preached God's word for 40 years and not a one listened. As he's concerned with false and insincere worship and a failure to trust Yahweh in national affairs, similar to Hosea's day. And yet false prophets stand in stark contrast, graphically depicted as not protecting the people, but setting snares and traps for them. Hosea says, watch out for their traps. Watch out for their scheming and deceptions. Verse 8, there's, there's only hostility. He says, Ephraim was a watchman with my God, a prophet. Yet the snare of a bird catcher is in all his ways. There's only hostility in the house of his God. All there is in the house of of a false god, of the false prophet, is enmity and animosity and hatred and hostility. While they may be proclaiming peace, peace, there may be no peace. Israel had sunken so low, so deep into sin, that the people considered the prophet who warned them as being a madman. He's a fool. And verse 9 furnishes a historical illustration of the heinousness of their corruption when he brings up Gibeah, as in the days of Gibeah. This is a likely reference to Judges 19 and 20. You say, okay, I don't remember my Old Testament history, especially the days of the Judges. Well, this was a shocking episode that chronicles the rape and murder of a Levite's concubine who was a guest. Doesn't get any more dastardly than that. He even dismembered her body to muster the tribes to deal with the perpetrators. It's one of the most shocking examples of sin in the Old Testament that leads to civil war and brought the tribe of Benjamin to the brink of collapse. But events even that heinous, they'd kind of grown calloused over. That's why God will remember their iniquity and punish their sins. The end of verse 9, he'll remember their iniquity, he'll punish their sins. Secondly, the people's defection to Baal in verses 10 to 14. And this begins reminiscing. God's reminiscing here, he says, I found Israel like grapes in the wilderness. I saw your forefathers as the earliest fruit on the fig tree in its first season. What in the world are we talking about? Go to the land of Palestine in your mind for a moment. Grapes are rare in the desert. So when they're found, they're special. And the early fig was especially delicious. But things quickly changed for Israel. Those who were recognizing the strong hand of God bringing them out of Egypt that was recognizing that while they were in their 40 years of wilderness wandering, their shoes didn't wear out. They got into the land and their memory got very faded. Didn't take long for them to display rotten fruit as Yahweh goes on to attest. He brings to their remembrance of Baal Peor in that same verse 10. Devoted themselves to shame. Okay, we need a little more reminder of Old Testament history. What is taking place? 
Well, this is the dark historical episode found in Numbers 25. Before she even entered into the promised land, the people slipped into worship of the local Baal. And we don't have time to renew our memories of the whole act in which 24,000 people died by plague as immediate judgment and discipline for her sin. But back in Numbers 25, just the first three verses, this is, again is before they got into the promised land. While Israel remained at Shittim, the people began to play the harlot with the daughters of Moab. They invited the people to the sacrifices of their gods, and the people ate and bowed down to their gods. So Israel joined themselves to Baal Peor, and the Lord was angry against Israel. And what's the end of the account tell us? 24,000 died by plague. Immediate judgment. These here in Hosea's day are people who have dedicated themselves to shame just like in that same day. They hadn't changed. The same kind of gross uh, apostasy. Verses uh, 11 and 12 of our text kind of, uh, if you were studying Hebrew, when you come to what they call an inclusio, these are brackets. And so we got a bracket in verse 11 and a bracket in verse 12. And it's all built around departure references. Notice it. Their glory, in verse 11, will fly away like a bird. And in the end of verse 12, God is the one departing from them. This is foreboding prophecy. It ought to conjure in our minds another glory departing. Another Ichabod passage. Remember in 1 Samuel 4, 10 to 22, what happens? You've got the ark of God, which represented, symbolized the presence and the power of God. And Israel thought that they could treat Yahweh as a genie in a bottle. He's their lucky rabbit's foot, if you will, the ark was. And we, they brought it up to the battlefield that would guarantee victory. Now, the enemies are scared because they had already heard about Yahweh who brought his people out of Egypt land by a strong hand. They're shaking in their booties. Philistines are scared because they'd heard of that strong hand. But you know what, they, you know what the Philistines didn't know? They didn't know that God's people were not in fellowship with him. No power, no sincere worship, no powerful presence from the holy people in communion with their holy God. In this episode, the ark is captured. The wicked sons, Hophni and Phinehas, die. And when da dear old dad Eli hears that the ark of God's been captured by the enemies, his own sons have died. He'd... Uh, um, you remember the Old Testament scenario of prosperity that you'd be old and thick? Well, this guy was old and thick. He's a big man. And when he fell over, he died at the news of the ark being captured and his sons dying. He fell over and died. His wife gives birth prematurely. She lost her sons, lost her husband, lost the symbolic presence of the power and the glory of God. And so what'd she name her son? Ichabod. The glory is departed. No glory. What a sad sight. What a sad account. Israel in the book of Hosea couldn't even shed a tear over it. Wrapped up inside these brackets is genocide. God's going to uh, prevent conceptions, gestations, and birth. No wonder, woe to them indeed. He says their glory will fly away like a bird. No birth, no pregnancy, no conception. Though they bring up their children, yet I will bereave them until not a man is left. Yes, woe to them indeed when I depart from them. Yeah, they may weep over 
losing their children, but they don't weep over losing their God. And verse 14 bursts forth with an imprecation. Remember the imprecatory psalms? This reads very much like those imprecatory psalms, where the psalmist is tattling on his enemy to God, asking God to bring out his judgment. How long, Lord? And here we've got the divine judgment of an aborting womb and non-lactating breasts. Quite, quite probably having Jacob's final prophecies and blessings in mind. You remember them in Genesis 49, 25? When he says, from the God of your father who helps you and by the Almighty who blesses you with blessings of heaven above, blessings of the deep that lies beneath, blessings of the breath, uh, the breasts and, and blessings of the womb. They, they'd have no more of that. And thirdly, in verses 15 to 17 of our text, Israel's syncretistic religion. Well, we can have one foot serving Yahweh and one foot serving the gods of this world. There's another mention of a geographical place, Gilgal. Verse 15, all their evil is at Gilgal. It was obviously a buzz location associated with evil, especially idolatrous worship. You get to verse 15, it's like a, a double barrel blast that kills relationship. The first barrel is hatred, quickly followed by canceled love. And when you read passages that talk about God's hatred and him canceling his love, that ought to suck the air out of the room. Verse 17 is Hosea's summary and interpretation of such shock and revelations of God's judgment. My God will cast them away because they haven't listened to him. They'll be wanderers among the nations. So, so who instigated this all? Mean God? No. Sinful people. Sinful people. My God will cast them away. Just like back in chapter 4 and verse 6 spoke about their culpable rejection of the knowledge about Yahweh. And then he references their immediate exile. Dark days ahead for unrepentant Israel. They'll surely become wanderers because of their disobedience. They've chosen false gods and idols and will now be forced to sleep in the bed that they'd made with their with the pagans and their false deities. Now, when we engage in Bible exposition week in and week out, what do we do? We read the text, we explain the text, and we use the text to exhort God's people to, here's the truth, let's walk in the way. Studying passages like this are important and necessary because few pulpits today deliver sermons on universal accountability, divine judgment, or an eternal conscious punishment in hell. There's a vacuum in the pulpits today. Years ago, there was a, a book that came out entitled, Ashamed of the Gospel, When the Church Becomes Like the World. In this, uh, well, I've got a, a third edition here before me, and in this, Dr. MacArthur speaks about how preaching that downplays God's wrath does not enhance our evangelism. What happened in all the, the from the church growth gurus? Let's try to reform and change worship so that unbelievers will feel comfortable and not uncomfortable in our midst when the church gathers to worship. Well, it doesn't enhance worship. It doesn't enhance our evangelism. It undermines it. He says, the solemnity of the gospel and the fear of God are utterly trampled when the preacher denies the reality and severity of eternal punishment. 
The authority of Scripture is compromised when so much of Christ's clear message must be denied or explained away. The seriousness of sin is depreciated by his teaching, and therefore the gospel itself is subverted. How deeply has that tendency to deny hell penetrated evangelicalism? Uh, Well, I would answer his question. Why is it that we've got a book coming out this next year on eternal conscious punishment in hell? It's because this false teaching has raised its ugly face yet again. So how deeply has it penetrated? One survey of evangelical seminary students revealed that nearly half, this is half of seminary students, 46% feel that preaching about hell to unbelievers is in poor taste. We've got to have bad news before we can get to good news. Worse, three out of every ten self-professed born-again people surveyed believe that good people will go to heaven when they die, even if they've never trusted Christ. One in every ten evangelicals say that they believe the concept of sin is outmoded. A 2002 article on the front page of the Los Angeles Times said this, quote, In churches across America, hell is being frozen out as clergy find themselves increasingly hesitant to sermonize on hell's fall from fashion indicate how key portions of Christian theology have been influenced by a secular society that stresses individualism over authority and the human psyche over moral absolutes. The rise of psychology, the philosophy of existentialism, and consumer culture have all dumped buckets of water on hell, or as I'm putting in the chapter that I'm contributing to the book this this year, they've air-conditioned hell. It's just too negative, said one professor of church history. Churches are under enormous pressure to be consumer-oriented. Churches today feel the need to be appealing rather than demanding, unquote. That from a national newspaper. No bastion of orthodoxy. You know, that, article, that same article quoted a pastor who told why he thought hell was omitted in the contemporary church. Here's what this pastor said. He said, it isn't sexy anymore. Really, is that, is that what the preacher's after? You ought to resign. Too many who have embraced the user-friendly trend have not carefully pondered how user-friendliness is incompatible with true biblical theology. It is at its heart a pragmatic, not a biblical outlook. It's based on precisely the kind of thinking that's eating away at the heart of orthodox doctrine. It's leading evangelicalism into neo-modernism and putting churches in a fast lane on the downgrade. You know, the answer is not an unfriendly church, but a vibrant, loving, honest, committed, worshiping fellowship of believers who minister to one another like the church did in the book of Acts. Such doctrines like hell and sin and judgment were jettisoned generations ago in an attempt to create a church in which unbelievers feel comfortable. We want them to come, we want them to hear the gospel, but it ought to look and feel and sound and smell different. As a result, most evangelicals are severely lacking in the fear of the Lord, or as one person said, their fear of God meter is in serious need of calibration. It's left most people unaccustomed to hard-hitting passages like the one we looked at this morning in Hosea 9. Readers are tempted to object to God's unapologetic, terrifying expressions of His wrath or attempt to edit or domesticate His words. You know, when you find verses like in Hosea 9, that I came to hate them, And I will love them no more. I will slay the precious ones of their wombs. Verses 15 and 16 are very sobering. 
Even the Jesus of the gospel record who said, I came to set a man against his family. These are admittedly hard to read. And beloved, ashamedly, I've even have to admit to vacillating, thinking that maybe we need to streamline Hosea 8, 9, and 10. We can just have one faithful exposition to cover it all. After all, how many times and in how many ways do we need to say it? Well, you know what? As many times and in the numerous ways God has. We must be committed as the faithful preacher Paul to preach the whole counsel of God, even though it takes work and it's heavy. Dear friends, let me give you four concluding theological and practical reasons that we're tempted to avoid and remain uncomfortable with the doctrine of God's wrath altogether. You mark them down. Come back to them this week and the weeks ahead as you meditate on them. The first I would submit to you is a shallow view of God's righteousness. Why do we avoid these heavy and hard sections? Because we get a shallow view of God's righteousness. A clear view of the incomparable righteousness of God is the necessary foundation for affirming his equally unrivaled right to judge. And yet because sin has corrupted everything and everyone that we have ever known, we find it exceedingly difficult to conceive of a God whose heart is perfectly pure, untouched by evil, and incapable of ever committing sin. Like I, I think we were at dialogue in, it must have been Wednesday night at Bible study. The people that grew up around Jesus when he increased in wisdom and in stature and in favor with God and man, Luke, Luke 2.52, they knew he was different. He never told a dirty joke, never dishonored his parents. He grew up a, a sinless man because he was the God-man. We find it difficult to conceive of a God whose heart is so pure. In 1 John 1, 5, we are told God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. Us who are filled with darkness. The psalmist says, you are not a God who takes pleasure in wickedness. No evil dwells within you. The scriptures are definitive that God can neither participate in sin nor ignore even the slightest sin in others. He must be activated towards it. Habakkuk testifies in Habakkuk 1.13, your eyes are too pure to approve evil and you cannot look on wickedness with favor. Because the Lord loves righteousness, Psalm 11.7, he justly hates sin and that unrelenting hatred culminates in the righteous judgment of all sinners and all sin. So an anemic view of God's righteousness will lead sinners who themselves are worthy of condemnation to shake their fists in protest at the perfections of God's just judgments, saying it's too harsh, too over the top. Second of all, a shallow view of sin. So if God is less holy in man's estimation and man is more holy, that's where the problem is. A superficial understanding of sin contributes to our unfounded resistance to affirm his right to universal judgment. Every sin, great or small, if you want to put it in those categories, I warn you about doing that. It's a frontal assault on the veracity of God's word and the trustworthiness of his character. Knowing that the Lord declared that the penalty for such treasonous rebellion is death ought to be sufficient to permanently inform our understanding of how abhorrent a thing sin is to him. Back in Genesis 2, everything finds its beginning in the book of beginnings. God said that in the day you eat of that fruit, you will what? You surely die. Don't minimize it. Don't ignore it. It's as truthful as God says it is. And yet we solve our accusing consciences 
by subjectively categorizing sin into minor infractions versus those weightier sins. That's why Jerry Bridges wrote his book, Respectable Sins, because there are no respectable sins. The Bible teaches just one infraction of the law of God carries the same sentence as breaking each and every one of them. James 2.10, James says, you break one, you're guilty of all. How many times you got to break the law to be a lawbreaker? One. In the words of J.I. Packer, there are no small sins against a great God. Let that rattle around our heads. Perhaps the greatest proof of the truly awful nature of sin is the fact that nothing less than the violent death of the God-man, Jesus Christ, could pay the penalty for sin. That ought to sober us about our sin. The cross of Christ stands as a monument not only to the, the magnitude of God's love for sinners, but also to the heinous nature of the sin itself. The Bible says from cover to cover, sin's grievous, it's wearisome, it's provoking, it's detestable to the Lord. Trivializing sin's detestable nature and presuming on God's abundant mercy result in a heart that stands in arrogant opposition to the unbending justice of God, thus the people Hosea addressed. Let me submit to you a third reason. A shallow view of love. You notice a theme? Shallowness. Shallowness about God's righteousness, shallowness about our sinfulness, and a shallowness about God's love. Being shocked or offended by the severity with which God chastises his people is at odds with a dreadfully inadequate understanding of God's love. The willingness of God to severely chastise his people doesn't meet the expectations of easygoing, indulgent affection created by feeble definitions of our love. To speak of the unconditional love of God, how often have you heard that or, God forbid, used it? God's love is not unconditional. Yeah, He takes us as we are through repentant faith, but He does such a work. He, he cleanses, He forgives, He changes. Only a weak Overly tolerant love would allow a rebellious nation to flourish in their sin. God had to deal with it. God's committed love could not prosper his people with wine and wheat and livestock and progeny while they remain unrepentant. Notice all the conditions in Scripture God gives. Rather... Driven by genuine love, the Lord would go to any length to separate his people from their idols, to bring them home to himself. As you've heard me say before from the sacred desk here, God is committed to frustrating our idolatry. That's why he said in the text last week, I'm going to smash your idols to pieces. Knowing how little human love resembles God's discriminating love is why the apostle Paul prayed that your love may abound still more and more in real knowledge and all discernment so that you may approve the things that are excellent. Is our theology of love a biblical theology of love as God gives it to us? So there's the shallow view of God's righteousness, the shallow view of man's sin, there's the shallow view of the love of God, fourth and finally, a shallow view of judgment itself. You know, as man wants to try to figure out, how is God glorified in the damnation of sinners, though he is? The denial of the reality of wrath and judgment, it runs deep in our hearts and lives. It's existed from the very beginning of time. Let me refer to Genesis again in our minds. In Genesis 3, it records that the first assault against truth was an attack on God's declaration that death would be the consequence of sin. They thought they could get away with it. The defiant 
blasphemous claim from Satan, you surely shall not die, has been used to deceive men into believing that they can sin without consequences or judgment ever since. And as a result, we really shouldn't be surprised when something inside us recoils at the thought of accountability to God. And joins in the age-old contradictory cry, I shall not surely die. I'm the exception to the rule. And yet to struggle to accept the future judgment of every man is to chafe against one of the most clearly attested doctrines in all of Scripture. The author of Hebrews states definitively in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed for men to die once, after that comes judgment. It's assured, death and taxes. I'll add on a biblical theology, death, taxes, and judgment. When the word perish is used in Scripture, it's not talking about us being annihilated, but eternal conscious punishment, not lavish joy in life in His presence of blessing. Paul speaks with solidarity that every mouth might be closed and all the world may become accountable to God. God's fixed a day in which he will judge the world in righteousness through man, through a man whom he appointed, having furnished proof by raising him. Who? That man, the man Christ Jesus, who will be judged. Those who possess a robust faith in this important doctrine don't merely concede the fact of God's right to exercise judgment, Their lives, their convictions, even their emotions are shaped by it. Think about the faithful martyrs that we read of in Scripture. The martyrs' future, not the martyrs' past. As they're in heaven, they express a visceral longing for the Lord to judge their assassins. How long, O Lord? As they cry out in unison, how long, O Lord, holy and true, will you refrain from judging and avenging our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Revelation 6.10. Even in the local assembly of believers here are motivated to forbear patiently with the sins and idiosyncrasies of one another, remembering that the coming of the Lord is near and the judge is standing right at the door. There are certain things we can leave to the sovereign spirit that they need our help on. Yes, we're to render biblical judgments as times arise, knowing that the ultimate judge is coming. But those who reject Christ and remain in their self-assured cynicism at the thought of personal accountability, in the last day will tremble in terror. D.L. Moody was an evangelist that survived the devastating Great Fire of Chicago in 1871, and afterwards, to try to convey the uh, the scene, he spoke this way. He said, it was my sad lot to be in the Chicago fire. As the flames rolled down our streets, destroying every tiling in their onward march, I saw the great and the honorable, the learned and the wise fleeing before the fire with the beggar and the thief and the harlot. All were alike. As the flames swept through the city, it was like the judgment day. Neither the mayor nor the mighty men nor the wise men could stop these flames. They were all on a level then. And many who were worth hundreds of thousands were left paupers that night. When the day of judgment comes, there'll be no difference. All sinners will suffer alike. So rather than offering a detached acknowledgement of God's judicial rights, the psalmist calls all creation to rejoice in God's pure and equitable judgment. He says, let the heavens be glad, let the earth rejoice, let the sea roar all all it contains, let the field exult in all that's in it, let the trees of the forest will sing for joy before the Lord, for he is coming to judge the earth. He'll judge the world in righteousness and the peoples in his faithfulness. You'll think of those who have suffered greatly for the gospel's sake. 
those who are jealous for God's glory, those who are weary of hearing his name blasphemed by the lips of arrogant men do indeed long for God to set the record straight, to put his glorious reputation on global display. Christians do not contest the truth of divine judgment and retribution. They call others to join them in rejoicing in it. John taught that an ever-maturing knowledge of and robust faith in God's redeeming love eliminates that cringing fear of God's just judgment. Remember how he writes in 1 John chapter 4? 1 John chapter 4 and verse 16, we've come to know and have believed the love which God has for us. God is love, and the one who abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this, love is perfected with us so that we may have confidence in that day of judgment, because as he is, so also are we in this world. There's no fear in love. But perfect love casts out fear because fear involves punishment and the one who fears is not perfected in love. Does that describe you, dear friend? Have you fled to him to escape the wrath to come? We must preach sin. We must preach judgment. We must preach repentance to be faithful evangelists. This is sin's recompense. You know, when we were studying on Hell in Mark 9, the seriousness that led into hellfire where Jesus is speaking to his followers, believers, that seeing where sin ends up in hell, it calls for radical amputation, a willingness to pluck out your eye or cut off your hand if that tool is what helps you in your sin. In desperation, killing our sin and protecting our fellowship with God and our service to Him. Would you pray with me? Father, so much more to be said because as we study the Word, it grows deeper and wider the longer we study it. Take the meager efforts that I have discharged as you hide me behind the cross. Take these words and that they would be put into practice in our lives. Thank you that you are a just God whose justice fell upon Christ so that he might declare us righteous in Christ alone, cause sinners to flee to Christ through our feeble but faithful efforts in evangelism. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's stand up and sing.